Amen. Amen. If you love me, keep my ways. That is a, that's a powerful song that really prepares us for um, the message today. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about the law of God uh, and the question as to whether the commandments still stand or are they done away with. And um, if uh, you're li listening and watching this for the first time, you're going to learn some things that you may not have learned before, um, because I'm going to I'm going to try to make it plain today that there are a lot of people that are confused over this issue because they don't understand the context. Remember what I just said? They do not understand the context. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me and then we're going to get into this presentation and uh, we're going to be looking at some scripture that's going to give us a definitive answer. Uh, go ahead and share this link with someone that you believe needs to see this. And um, let's go ahead and pray. All right. Let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love towards us. And we thank you, Lord, for your desire to see us walk in truth. And so, Lord, speak to us now. Uh, show us. Your truth from your word is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. All right. <clears throat> so I want to start with the, the uh, idea of the law of God. Or actually, let me, let me do it this way. I want to first talk about the, the moral crisis that we often hear about that is happening in our nation uh, and depending on where you are in the world, in the world, okay? Um, you can go online and find any number of articles uh, talking about the erosion of America's foundation. And usually this is from the perspective of Christians, right? Christians are the ones that are typically talking about the moral decay destroying America. I'm just showing you a couple of articles here. Uh, here's one from, the, uh, from Barna Research, The End of Absolutes, America's New Moral Code. And they're kind of talking about how, you know, people are just making up their own morals, right? Nothing is absolute anymore. Um, Christians decry this all the time. Uh, we, we see another one here, Surrey, Departure from God is Cause of America's Moral Decline, right? Um, all of these are issues that, that we are facing. Here's one on the theology of, of, of abortion, right? Um, the commandment, thou shall not kill. Thou shall not kill. And that one is really, really, I mean, that's a present issue we're dealing with right now. And uh, it, for the Christian, the argument is, right? The commandment says, thou shall not kill. And, and we ought to obey the word of God. And this is why there's such a moral decline because no one is listening or obeying the word of God uh, anymore. Here you have another one, 10 reasons why it's wrong to take the life of unborn children. And you could see the first one uh, given there. And we're just going to look at this very quickly is God commanded thou shall not murder. And Exodus chapter 20 is quoted. And so... <clears throat> Uh, it, is, it is a serious issue, right, for Christians, and I'm speaking specifically to Christians today. Um, I mean, everyone is, is welcome to listen, but the question again is, is this. What is the position that a Christian should take towards the law of God, especially as it relates to what we call the moral decline that is happening in the world? Well, let me suggest to you that while the Christian world is, is you know, kind of looking at how nobody's following God anymore and, you know, people are turning their backs on the Bible, people are turning their backs on, on the word of God and coming up with their own morals, may I suggest that perhaps part of the reason for that is actually, it actually has to do with Christianity and its position on the word of God itself. Let me say that again. Could the reason that, that people are turning away from 
the word of God and from uh, uh, you know, God's absolute morals, could the reason be because of what they are seeing within Christianity itself? Now, I know that sounds like, whoa, kind of harsh, but I need you to follow this because I'm going to show you something. Let's go back to the screen. And I want you to notice what Romans chapter 2, verse 21 uh, through 24, around 24 says. Notice what it says here. Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest, a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, Dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that maketh thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? And now look at this next verse. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Let me pause for a second. Back in Paul's day, Paul was saying, listen, because of the, of the hypocrisy of the professed people of God, the Gentiles are blaspheming the name of God. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So if we were to ask, you know, the, the typical Christian, okay, um, why should abortion be outlawed. And the response is going to be because the commandment says thou shalt not kill. And why is our country, you know, going into more decline? Oh, because they're not obeying the word of God. They're not obeying the moral absolutes of God. You hear Christians say this without blinking an eye. It's a natural response, right? What are they doing that they shouldn't be doing? And the answer is they are not keeping God's moral law. Yet, the very same Christians, if you turn around and ask them, hey, as a Christian, should you keep the commandments? And they will begin to quote verses like this. Notice with me on the screen, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, hold on a second. I, I, just, I just inquired, why do you think America's on a moral decline? And the answer was, America's on a moral decline because they are not keeping the law of God. They are not keeping the moral absolutes of God. And yet, when the question is turned around and asked, should you keep the law as a Christian, then all of a sudden, you get a totally different response. Ah, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. Or how about this one? How about this one? Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15. Uh, uh, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in, him, himself of twain, one new man, so making peace, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And they'll respond, listen, we don't have to keep the law because it was nailed to the cross. But I want you to understand for the secular mind how confusing that sounds. On one hand, abortion should be outlawed because the Bible clearly says thou shalt not kill. It's one of the commandments, and Exodus chapter 20 is quoted. You guys, you heathen, you atheists, you non-believers, you Gentiles, you, you people that are not of God, you need to keep the law. But when the very same question is posed to the believer, oh, the law's been nailed to the cross. We don't have to keep the commandments. It's been done away with. That's the Old Testament. So I want you to understand the confusion. And again, my question is, could, could the reason that the world has turned away or, or does not acknowledge the law of God is because the church does not acknowledge the law of God? While 
while telling the world that the world needs to acknowledge the law of God. We need moral absolutes. We need the law of God. We need God. We need people to understand that God's word does not change. But here's the issue, guys, because those two verses that we just read, they, they sound like what people say, right? Like, yeah, the text clearly says that. We're going to go back and look at that. But we got to ask ourselves a question. Is the Bible contradicting itself, right? Is that a fair question? Would you say that's a fair question? Is the Bible contradicting, contradicting itself? Does the Bible have a double standard? And is that the reason why Christians also have a double standard? Hey, thou shalt not kill. Stop abortion. Or, oh, but at the, in the same breath, ah, we're not under the law. We're under grace. The law has been nailed to the cross. The law has been done away with. That's confusion. Okay, so, so let's see. Does the Bible contradict itself? Well, look at Jesus' own words. Jesus said in Luke 18, 20, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. So in Jesus' mind, the commandments still stood. How about John 14, 21? He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and manifest myself unto him. So again, Jesus seems clear that the commandments still stand. Notice Revelation 22, verse 14. It's the last book of the Bible. And here it says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. How about Revelation 12, 17? And the dragon, that is Satan, was wroth with the woman, which represents the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How about 1 John 3, 4? Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is what, everyone? It is the transgression of the law. So, we see here pretty clearly that the law of God, in, in some places in the Bible, it appears to stand, but in other places we just read that the handwriting of ordinances was blotted out, that we're not under the law, we're under grace. What, what's going on here? How about 1 John 5, 2? By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. What in the world is going on? Let me say this to you, that I believe that the majority of Christians are just confused. And I'm not saying that in a mean derogatory way. I'm saying that in a way that, you know, there are Christians who, who want to know truth and they can't make sense of how the Bible in one place can say the law of God still stands, but in another place, it says we're not under the law and the law has been nailed to the cross. And so in, in, in being unable to, to mend these two so that they make sense, you'll find them, you'll find a lot of Christians will jump from one position, depending on who they're talking to, to another position, depending on who they're talking to. So when they're talking to the world, ah, oh, the Bible says thou shalt not kill and the law of God is unchangeable. And when has God ever, these are not 10 commandments, these are 10, these are not 10 suggestions, they're 10 commandments, right? You hear things like that. But you turn around and ask these same Christians, do you need to keep the commandments? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. The commandments have been done away with. Uh, we're not under the old covenant anymore. We're under the new covenant. And they're not, these people are not intentionally trying to be deceptive. At least I don't think. I just think that there are a lot of Christians who don't understand the context. What did I say, everyone? They don't understand the context. And maybe it's because they haven't been taught it. Maybe it's because they, that what they're hearing from the pulpits is not making sense, but they're just going along with it anyway. So what we're going to do uh, in this study, in this message, is we're going to understand the context so that you can step back and see the big picture and really get this, okay? That's what we're after. We're after understanding. So no matter who you are, no matter what Christian background you are from, context is extremely important.
right? We don't want to contradict the Bible or worse yet, seem like hypocrites by telling the world, thou shalt not kill. It's a commandment. You need to stop abortion. But at the same time, we're turning around and saying the law of God has been nailed to the cross. We don't need to keep it anymore because Jesus came. That doesn't quite add up. Okay, so are y'all ready? Put a one in the chat if you're ready. You're like, all right, Pastor, let's, let's get the context. Let's try to understand. All right, so let's do that. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to go to Genesis 1, and we're going to begin to paint a picture that is hopefully by the grace of God going to make this very simple and hopefully unforgettable. You will never be confused about this again, no matter what text you read in the Bible that seems to be saying one thing, you'll be like, oh, I get that now. Oh, I get this now. All right, watch. So Genesis chapter one and verse 27, Heavenly Father, again, we pray that you give us understanding. Help me to make this simple, Lord. Help me to make this plain in Jesus name. Amen. So when we go to Genesis chapter one, beginning with verse 27, the Bible says here, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Replenish the earth and subdue it. So let's pause right here for a second. In the beginning, we know that God created mankind and he gave them a commission to what? Be fruitful and multiply right? So man is supposed to cover the earth with, with other men, right? With human beings, with offspring, be fruitful and multiply. We also know that God tells Adam and Eve or Adam in the garden, Genesis 2, 16, the Bible says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we know that God commands man, listen, don't eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do so, you are going to die. You're going to die. Well, we know that in the very next chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says, speaks about this serpent that deceives Adam and Eve. It's the devil, right? In Genesis 3, 1, the Bible says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also, to, uh, uh, gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And we know that this is how sin entered, right? This is how sin entered. Okay, so when sin enters, when sin enters, uh, Adam and Eve are now under a new power. At that moment, who is now ruling mankind? Just put it in the chat for me, please. Who is now ruling mankind the moment that Eve, as well as Adam, eat from the tree? Whose are they? Who do Adam and Eve now rightfully belong to? Very good. Very good. They are now Satan's. They belong to him. Now, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> as they left, as it were, as they begin to be fruitful and multiply, who do all that offspring now belong to? Who do, who do all the offspring now belong to? Right? All that offspring that's going to be born, they would belong to Satan. Okay? So just follow this. If God had not intervened, then all the offspring of Adam and Eve would belong to Satan. 
Now, here's what we find is very interesting. Go with me back to the screen, and I want you to notice Romans 5, verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All right, come back, come back. So <clears throat> we know that when Adam and Eve sinned, they had given themselves over to the devil, and in giving themselves over to the devil, their offspring were also given over to the devil because through their sin, all humankind was guilty because all humankind were in their loins. Did that, did that make sense? Put a one in the chat if that makes sense, if you're following me so far. All right? So now, if, if we're keeping track, right, Adam and Eve, the only two human beings on the planet, now belong to Satan. And how many people does God have on the planet as his own? Zero. Zero. None. Adam and Eve have now given themselves over to death. They've given themselves over to Satan for him to rule them. Now, it, it is in that context that I want you to check out Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, notice what it says on the screen, Genesis 3.15. So God, after giving Adam his punishment and Eve her punishment, he then turns to the serpent and he begins to speak his punishment. And I want you to notice what Genesis 3.15 says. Genesis 3.15 reads, God speaking, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between, now watch this, guys, thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, let's, let's come back here. So notice this. God says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. Now, what does that indicate? What does that indicate? Who would be the devil's seed? And I, I want you all to think with me, okay? Who would be the devil's seed? Who would that represent? I want to see if you all put it in the chat. Just want to see if you can get... Who would that represent? Who would the devil's seed or the devil's offspring, as it were, represent? You are for the devil. Who would that be? Very good, Rick. It would be everybody. It would be mankind. It would be unbelievers. Very good, Carolina. It would be unbelievers. Sergio says Cain. Very good. Rob says us. Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> us. Let me ask you, which one of us were born followers of Christ? <laughs> None of us. None of us. So watch what God is saying here. God is literally saying to Satan, look, you may have just taken over all of humanity. But when God says, I will put enmity between the woman's seed and your seed, he has just spoken into existence the fact that he is about to redeem a people out of Satan's camp. Put a one in the chat if, that, if, if you just caught that. You just got Adam and Eve, okay? And, and, and in them is the whole human family. But I'm letting you know that there's going to be enmity between your seed and her seed. God has just spoken a gospel promise there. I'm about to redeem humanity. And that redemption is going to be evident in her seed and, and particularly in one individual who is that seed that, that he's ultimately talking about. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me so far? I know you're like, Pastor, we're supposed to be talking about the law. Trust me, we're going to get there. But I need you to understand Genesis 3.15 first. Okay? No. No. <clears throat> what is enmity? What is enmity? So, so the, 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 the text said, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. So enmity, beloved, is something that is placed in between two individuals or two groups to keep them separate. 
Rav, very good. Enmity is division. You're either on this side or that side. So God says, I'm going to put division between my seed, my people, right? Through the woman and through your people. Please put a one in the chat if you understand that. <clears throat> I'm going to put division between my people, those who choose to follow me, and those who choose to follow you. Now, I got a question for you. So think of it, think of it like division, enmity is division. You might think of it of something as something like a partition. It's opposition. It's to be against, right? That's what enmity is. I'm going to put something between my people and your people, and it's going to serve as a buffer. Now, watch this. A lot of you are saying, ah, oh, mutual hatred. But let me ask you a question. Is this enmity, is it a good thing or a bad thing? You, we're going to take a vote right now. Put, put, just go ahead and put the word bad or good. Let's see what you put in the chat. Is it a bad thing or a good thing? All right, so I see some saying good. I see some saying bad. Well, let me just tell you that if God put it there, God said, I will put enmity, then it's a good thing. Now watch this, guys. God is putting enmity. Now, now, now what he's doing, is he, giving, is he giving Satan's seed enmity? Is God putting a, a, a desire to stay apart? Is he putting that in bad people, in people who are like, I'm, uh, you know, I am Satan's seed? Is that what he's doing? No, 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 beloved. God never puts enmity against righteousness. God is not the author of making bad people hate good people or bad people not want anything to do with good people. That's not what God does because God's trying to save how many? He's trying to save everybody. So the enmity he's putting there is in his own people. I'm going to create a division that's going to separate my people who I'm gathering, by the way, who I'm redeeming from your camp. Amen. Amen. I'm going to put a, a, a barrier of protection. I'm going to put a, 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 a partition. I'm going to put a dividing wall between my people and your people. And this is going to keep my people safe for a reason, for a purpose. So, so number one, the Bible says that he was going to put enmity, in other words, a buffer between his people and Satan's people. By the way, I want you to note this on the screen. Note, note the text. <clears throat> He's going to put enmity. Note that first thing. J James 4.4, 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So see that? Enmity means that you're for, for something and against something. You're on one side or the other. There's a dividing wall between you and that other thing. All right, all right. So let's keep moving. <clears throat> Someone said, who's the devil's seed? Is that us? And let me, let me get your answer from this. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So let me ask you a question. Who was the devil's seed? Who was a devil's seed? Everybody. Everybody. But God said, I'm going to separate a people out of that seed. Now, please, just follow along. Don't even worry about the law right now, because when we get to it, you're going to be like, ah, you, Pastor, you don't have to say anymore. I get it now. So just follow along. Follow along. So, so enmity, God says, I'm going to put enmity. I'm going to draw out a people right, out of your offspring, and they're going to be my people, and I'm going to separate them. I'm going to put a dividing wall between my people and your people. Those who follow me and serve me versus those who follow you and serve you. Now, I want you to note this. Again, Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. Neither is his hair heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, 
and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. None call it for truth, nor any plead for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Let me rephrase it this way. All, all who are against God because of their sins are the devil's offspring. Remember how Jesus said in the book of, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the gospels, when he was talking to the Pharisees, he said, you are of your father, the devil, and his works you do. You are of your father, the devil. So that gives you an idea. The devil's seed would be all the wicked. God, the woman's seed will be those who come out of that group to serve God. Okay. So <clears throat> we see that God gives a, 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 in fact, no, no, let me, let me go back here. Let me go back here. Um, no, we can do that. Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did, did the Lord God give coats of skin and clothe them. This is his act of redemption. This is his act of redemption, right? When he, when he gives them these coats of skins, how do they get these coats of skins? An animal had to die. So Adam and Eve are the first per people redeemed under the gospel umbrella. Did you catch that? Adam and Eve are the first people redeemed under the gospel umbrella. And how do we know that? Because when God clothed them, he had an animal had to die in order to cover them, to cover their nakedness. Are y'all with me so far? Okay. <clears throat> Not only does the prophecy say that he would put a, a enmity between his people and God's people, but it goes on to say that, that this seed would bruise the head of the serpent. Okay, so number one, I will put enmity. Number two, I'm going to bruise that my son, Christ, is going to defeat or bruise the head of the serpent, right? So y'all get that. And all of you are very familiar with this, but I'm about to show you something now. You're about to see something now because there's a third part of this prophecy. You see, in defeating, watch this, in defeating the enemy, that is in defeating Christ, he would then remove the enmity. Okay. Now, I know that y'all are not getting this. You may not get this right now. Remove the enmity. What? He put it there. Watch this. He put the enmity there because of what Satan did. Now he says, uh, so I'm going to put enmity. My son is going to bruise your head. That means I'm going to defeat you. And then we're going to see that as a result of Satan being, defeat, Satan being defeated, he will, in essence, remove the enmity. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Why would God remove the enmity? Why would he get rid of the enmity? So hold on. We're about to lay this down. Okay. So we know that this is Genesis, right? We see here, we're looking for three things. Number one, he's going to put enmity. Number two, he's going to destroy the, the devil. And then number three, he's going to remove the enmity. Now, I haven't proven to you yet about removing the enmity. All I've shown you from scripture is that he put enmity and that he would bruise the head of the serpent. Okay, so we know that in Leviticus chapter 20, uh, chapter 22, chapter 20, verse 22, that um, God has called Israel out of Egypt. He has separated a people for himself out of, e out of the world. It's a peculiar people. A and we read in Leviticus 20, verse 22, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and shall do them that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manner of the nations which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Watch this. But I have said unto you, you shall inherit the land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have done what? Separated you from other people. Separated you from other 
people. Let me just throw another one in here very quick. 1 Kings 8, 53. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance, as thou spakest by the hand of Moses, thy servant, when thou brought our fathers out of Egypt. So let's just recap here. What do we see God doing here? Is God, has God separated for himself a people? Is there the offspring of the woman? Is there the seed of the woman and also the seed of the world? Yes or no? Put a one in the chat. If you're following so far, okay, I get it. God separated his people, Israel, from the rest of the world. Put a one in the chat if you get that thus far. I'm following you, Pastor. I, 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 I got this. Yes, he separated his people, right? And, 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 and now you've got two distinct lines. You had them before Israel, right? You had the sons of God in Genesis 6 and the daughters of men in Genesis 6, just when the flood was happening. So we've always seen that line, Cain and Abel. Yeah, right? You can just, just go down the line and trace the lineage of, of those who serve God and those who serve Satan. So the seed of the woman and the seed of the devil. Cain would have been the seed of the devil. Yes? Okay. So now God's got a whole group of people. It's a nation. Israel, and he separates them. We see that in the text. Now, I want you to notice what he does next. In Exodus 34, verse 28, watch this, watch this. All right, now, now y'all can get ready. Now y'all can get ready. In Exodus 34, verse 28, speaking of Moses, he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the ten what, everyone? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Okay. So God here is now giving the children of Israel a law. What is that law? The law is called the Ten Commandments. Not the Twelve Commandments. Not the Fifteen Commandments. Not the 600 commandments, but the 10 commandments, and they're written on stone. Now, what do I want you to understand about these commandments? Well, first of all, the most important thing I need you to understand is this. These 10 commandments, thou shall not kill, right? Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not lie. Thou shall not steal. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. These commandments, listen carefully, describe sin. They are the description of sin. Put a one in the chat if that makes sense to you. The Ten Commandments are the description of sin. If you kill, it is sin. If you lie, it is sin. If you commit adultery, it is sin. If you... If you a uh, covet, it is sin. The Ten Commandments describe what sin is. This is why the Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And this is why Romans 3, verse 20 says, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in other words, what Paul is saying here is that the only purpose that the law serves, that when he's talking specifically about the Ten Commandments now, is to tell you what sin is. Remember Paul said, I had not known, uh, uh, um, what is it? I had not known uh, lust, except the, the law said, thou shalt not covet. He's saying, listen, the law tells me what sin is. The law is the description of sin. So, so the children of Israel were commanded to, to not sin, to keep the commandments of God. Don't lie, don't steal, etc. Okay, y'all good with that so far? Now I'm going to introduce you to something else, and I want you to watch this. In the video, what happened if someone sinned? What happened if someone sinned? That's the question, right? How did God deal with sin? So the commandments only reveal, okay, you're in the guilty category, right? You've sinned. Now, how, does, how did God deal with sin in the Old Testament? So I want you to watch again. I want you to notice what's on the screen. 
Luke 4 verse 1, Le Leviticus 4 verse 1, I'm sorry. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest, and they, so they give, they go through and say, if it's a priest, if it's a ruler, et cetera, right? And this is just an example. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. So let me ask you a question. What happened if a person sinned in the Old Testament? What would they have to do? They would have to perform a ceremony. And that ceremony was a sacrifice. Right? It's a ceremony. It's, kind of, it's a ritual that you go through in order to be forgiven for what? Breaking the law. What law? So watch this. There was a law. So there's the law that describes sin. Okay, there's a law that describes sin, and then there's something else that was done when one broke that law. And look again at what the Bible says, Hebrews 9, 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So let me ask you a question. What law is Paul talking about here? And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. What law is he talking about? When you read the Ten Commandments, do you, do you see anything about the need to bring blood or the need to shed blood in order to forgive sins? No, there's nothing in the Ten Commandments that talks about sacrifice, right, or how you're forgiven for your sins. It's just the description of sin. But there was another law given that was what we will call the prescription for sin. This is the ceremonial law. The ceremony, like, what is the ceremony that is necessary to carry out if one has sinned? Ah, if you sin, if you break the law, then the response is, the remedy is, the cure is the ceremonial law. You have to sacrifice an animal. Put a one in the chat if that's clear for you right now. The, the, the ceremonial law, the, the moral law was the description or is the description of sin. The ceremonial law was the prescription for sin. Oh, I've sinned. I want to be forgiven. Okay. Well, this is what you need to do. Are y'all good so far? Okay. Excellent. Very good. Very good. So let's keep moving. So... Here's a question now. Um, that's a good thing. God has provided for his people. There's an there's a, a issue, and that is sin. But God has provided for his people the remedy for sin. Now, let me ask you a question. What about the devil's seed? What about the devil's seed? Let's say that they did something wrong. Could they walk up into the camp of Israel and be like, man, only way to get forgiveness is to just like, you know, go offer up an animal. Could they do that? Yes or no? So y'all are already jumping ahead of me. Y'all are already seeing this. <clears throat> could they do that? No, they could not do that. So let me try to phrase it this way. There was something blocking them from gaining access to the cure for sin. Put a fire emoji in the chat if you just got that. Put, put a one, whatever you need to put in the chat, just put that there for me so I know you got that. There was something, there was a, a wall, a, a series of, of things that, that separated them from having access to the cure. So remember, God says I'm going to put enmity so that I'm going to separate my people from the world. The world is not going to be able to just, to just you know, find, they're, they're going to be separate from what my people have access to. There's, there's your seed and there's my seed, my people. My people 
When they sin, they're going to have a cure for that sin. But your people, when they sin, they have no cure. Is all hope lost for the devil's seed? Watch, watch. Follow this, guys. Follow this. <laughs> watch this. Is there a way that they could get access that this, the, the, these, you know, what, they, what the Jews would call Gentiles, right? Or, or, or the heathen, right? Or the devil's seed. Was there a way that they could have access to gain access to the cure for sin? Which in the Old Testament was sacrifice, the shedding of blood. I want you to notice what Exodus 12 verse 43 says. This is the Passover the Lord's speaking about here. And the Bible says here this, and the Lord said unto Moses, unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. Now I need you to get this right. The Passover is the very first festival of the Jewish year. No stranger was allowed to eat the Passover. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Let's just come back here real quick. Let's say that you were a stranger. Let's say that you were a stranger, right? You're, a, you know, you're an Egyptian. And you're like, man, I just feel this weight of guilt on me. But, and I believe that the God of Israel can, can save me from that weight of guilt. But wait a minute. I can't eat of the Passover. I can't get access to the ceremonial system that cures my guilt. This is the Old Testament. I can't get rid of this. I can't get access. There's, it's like I would like to, do, but there is this wall. And the wall says, if you're not an Israelite, you can't enter in. Put a one in the chat if you get that. There is this, this separation. It almost feels like enmity. Like, man, does God have something against me? Why can't I have access? All right, let, let's keep moving. Let's, let's go back to the text. Exodus 12, verse 44. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised them, then shall he... Wait, what? When you have what? Hold on, hold on. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad, out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone thereof. Watch this, verse 47. And all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Now, verse 48. And when a stranger sojourns with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let them come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. All right, y'all. Put a one in the chat. <laughs> what was the one thing that those who were afar off, meaning the devil seed, right? The devil seed, they have been separated by enmity, right? God has put enmity, something that is against the stranger, not against his people, that is against the stranger. Oh, man, look at Israel. They're getting saved over there. They got salvation over there. I want to get in, but I can't. There's this wall. There's this wall of laws that, per, that, that exclude me from getting access to the cure. But you know God is merciful, right? He says, listen, if, if you who are of the devil's seed truly want salvation, then the answer is, in order to get access to the cure, right? The sacrifices that bring forgiveness in the Old Testament. In order to get access, you must be what, everyone? Come on, put it in the chat, y'all. You must be what? Circumcised, and then you can come near. Remember that phrase, y'all. Then you can come near. So in order for them to come near, because they were far, enmity, there's a distance, there's a separation, this thing is against you, but if you want to come near, Man, you're going to have to go through something quite painful. You're going to have to be circumcised as an adult. Who? Not only you, but your whole family of men. That's what the text says. Let him and all the males in his family be circumcised. Who? Man, that was difficult. 
Watch this. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. I want you to see this. So, so, so note here then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that, without, that at that time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God. Do you see this? Let me read that again. Wherefore, wherefore, remember. Rem oh, okay. Hold on a second, y'all. Give me one second. I, I need to do something here. So let me just... Let me just do this. And I'm going to share some text with you that, um, that I actually didn't have up here. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so I want you to watch this, guys. I want you to watch this. So, so here's a question. Let me go back to the slide. Here's a question. How, how was this against Satan's seed, right? That's the question. How was this, this law of circumcision against the seed of Satan? Well, number one, you could not get access to the cure unless you were circumcised. So, so let, me, let me go back to this. You understand that the cure and the prescription for sin and the description for sin are two different things. One law describes sin the other law points you to the cure for sin, and that's under the Old Testament. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? Okay, so, so the question again is, how is this against or in opposition? Almost, how was this difficult for the, for the Gentile, for the person that was not an Israelite? Well, number one, notice, notice on the screen, number one, you could not get access to the cure unless you were circumcised. Number two, the Gentiles would have to journey to the temple to get access. In other words, if you were far away from, from the temple, like you lived in a, in a totally different nation, the only way for you to get salvation, you couldn't just be in your house and be like, well, uh, let me offer up a lamb. No, 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 no. You had to go to the temple. Watch, watch. Leviticus 4, 4. He shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock and kill the bullock before the, before the Lord. So in other words, Israel wasn't really worried about that because the temple was right in their midst. But if you're a Gentile, you got to go to the temple. You may have to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. Wait, wait, there's more. Number three, not only was it to be done in the temple, it was to be done in Jerusalem and no other place. Notice Deuteronomy 12, 10. But when you go over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you the rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in the land safely, then shall there be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you. Watch this, you guys your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes and your heave offerings of your hand and all your choice vows, which you shall make unto the Lord. Watch this. And you shall rejoice before the Lord, your God, you and your sons, your daughters, your manservants, your maidservants and the Levite that is within your gates for as much as he has no part of the inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you offer not thy burnt offering in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of those tribes Therefore thou shalt offer thy burnt offering, and there, thou sh there shalt thou do what I command thee. So in other words, beloved, you couldn't be in Texas. G give me a one in the chat if you understand what I just said. You couldn't be in, you know, in, in, in Jamaica or France or some other place and just be like, ah, you know what, I need forgiveness right now, so let me just like throw up an altar in my house. No, 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 no. You had to go. 
Think about those who lived afar off. The only way that they could get there is that they had to travel great distances from one nation to another. Man, that sounds pretty difficult, y'all. How about this? How about this? Not only did they have to travel, watch this. I need you to see this, okay? Let's just go back to the description for sin. Was there circumcision required to keep the law, thou shalt not kill? Was circumcision required to keep that commandment? Was circumcision required for a person to keep the commandment, do not bear false witness? I want you to watch this. No circumcision was required to do any one of these commandments. Number two, no temple was required to keep any of these commandments. No temple, no sacrifice. In order not to steal, you don't have to give a sacrifice first and go to the temple. No, 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 no. It's just do not steal. None of these commandments require you to go to Jerusalem to keep them. Not I am the Lord your God. You can keep that anywhere. No idolatry. You can keep that anywhere. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. You can keep that anywhere. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You can keep that anywhere. Honor your mother and father. Do not commit adultery. No murder. No sin. You can keep those anywhere. No sacrifice. No temple. No circumcision was required to keep the description of the law or what we call the description of sin. No, no Circumcision, temple, sacrifice, Jerusalem visit required, nothing. But if you were trying to get the cure, the cure was only local. So watch this. The description of sin was universal. Anywhere in the world where someone kills, it is sin. Anywhere in the world where someone lies, it is sin. Anywhere in the world where someone works with graven image, it is sin. But in those days, the prescription for sin was only local, meaning it was only in Israel. Now, <laughs> watch this, guys. So we've just clearly identified that Jesus, that God himself put enmity between his seed and the seed of the devil. There was a separation, a distinction, and they could not get access to forgiveness of sins unless they were to go through that most discouraging wall of circumcision. If you were circumcised, then you could keep the Passover. Then you could keep the first fruits. Then you could keep all these feasts, which all were connected with sacrifices. In other words, were all designed to be a part of the process of cleansing from sin. Now, that's part one of the prophecy. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now, the second part of the prophecy is I will, my seed will bruise the head of the serpent. And we know this happened at Calvary. Matthew 27, 33, and when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, please note here, I love this, Jesus died on a skull-shaped hill. Remember the prophecy says that Jesus would bruise the head of the serpent. The hill is called Calvary, which in the Greek is cranion. It's also called Golgotha, which is literally called the place of a skull. When Jesus died, he was breaking the, the head, the skull, as it were, of, of Satan. Now, now, watch this, guys. Watch what happens when Jesus dies and, in essence, crushes the skull of the serpent. Watch what the text says. <clears throat> Matthew 27, 33. <clears throat> And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull, there it is, just so you can see it, just so you can have reference. Now watch this. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake. Now let me ask you a question, y'all. Let me ask you a question. When the veil of the temple is rent in two, <clears throat> what does that signify? What did that signify? What was shut down? Come on, y'all. What was shut down? The place where people went 
to get cured of sin has been shut down. God, why would you do that? <clears throat> what are people going to do now when they sin? <clears throat> <laughs> what will people do now if they lie or steal or commit adultery? Those th things still exist, y'all. The description for sin is the very same as it was in the Old Testament. The description remains the same, but evidently God is saying, I'm shutting down the house where I used to, you know, make available a cure because a new cure is coming. <laughs> and if a new cure is coming, then we have no need for the system which provided an old cure. Put a one in the chat. No, put a seven in the chat, y'all. If y'all are catching this right now. When the temple is shut down, what God is demonstrating here is that the prescription is about to become universal through the blood of Christ. And beloved, watch this. The prescription becoming universal does nothing to change the description of sin. The description of sin is still the same thing. Killing in the New Testament is the same as killing in the Old. Lying today is the same as lying in the garden. Stealing today is the same as stealing back then. The description of sin remains the same, but what Jesus has come to do away with is an ineffective cure. The cure was only symbolic of something that was to come in the future. And that thing that was to come in the future was the very blood of Jesus. Yes, the vaccine was upgraded to one that really works. <laughs> Are you all catching this? Not only was the temple no longer significant, the temple would be destroyed, beloved, in 70 AD. But not only was the temple destroyed, watch this, look at the text, Luke 21, 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down under the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles should be fulfilled. In other words, not only... Not only was the temple destroyed, but the city was destroyed. Meaning, listen guys, meaning, watch this, the, the temple where the prescription was found and the city where, you could, where the, the, the prescription was found, both are now destroyed. It's almost as if in Christ's death, the enmity when he bruises the head of Satan, he now says, okay, I'm about to remove, <laughs> I'm about to remove the separating wall. And now, hmm, I'm about to remove the enmity. Watch this, guys. In Galatians 6.15, for in Christ Jesus Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Circumcision is no longer required to get access to the remedy. Do you understand that? Jesus Christ in dying became our circumcision. So now for the Gentile who is now trying to look for salvation, guess what's been removed? He no longer has to go through the painful process of circumcision. All he needs is a circumcision of the heart. All right? How else was the enmity removed? Circumcision no longer needed. Watch this. Watch this, guys. A journey to the temple under the new covenant, a journey to the temple is no longer needed to get access to the cure. Number two, a journey to Jerusalem is no longer required to get access to the cure. And number three, actually, number four, number one is a circumcision. Number two is a journey to the temple. Number three is a journey to Jerusalem. And number four, the cure itself has been updated and is now universally available. How are y'all doing? Are y'all getting the context? 
So now when we go to the New Testament and we start reading, right? We start reading these verses that we, when we read them out of context, we're just like, well, it must mean the law of God's done away with. No, 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 no. Now I understand. Watch this, beloved. In this new system, there's a new way to get forgiveness. It's no longer circumcision. It's no longer going to the temple. It's no longer going to Jerusalem. Now in Christ, when I sin, when I lie, when I steal, when I commit adultery, in Christ, I have a new means of forgiveness. Christ hasn't done away with the description for sin. He has done away with the prescription for sin. Did y'all catch that? Watch this. Watch this. We're about to, we got a few more texts, parts of, of chapters, and then we're going to be done. So just follow this. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. What does that mean? No longer do I need to be circumcised. No longer do I need to travel to a temple. No longer do I need to go to Jerusalem if I want to be cured from my lying and stealing. No, 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 no. There's a new way now, and that new way is through his flesh. His flesh has taken the place of that enmity. He has consecrated for us a new way through the veil. That is to say through his flesh. That means his death. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Oh, man. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let us draw near. Watch this, guys. You could not draw near before unless you were circumcised in heart. I mean, in flesh. Then you could draw near. Remember the text? We just read it. Remember? Let's go back to it. Let's go back. Let's go back. No, nope, it's not there. We're just going to keep moving forward. So in, in other words, they had to draw, in order for them to draw near, they had to be circumcised. Not anymore. Not anymore. That's been done away with. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How about this? Ephesians 2. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What was that middle wall of partition? You got to be circumcised if you want to join us. You got to come to Jerusalem if you want to join us. You got to come to the temple. If, all right, you trying to say you're not the devil's seed anymore? You want to be down with us? You got to be circumcised. You got to come to Jerusalem. You got to come to the temple. That's what, and, and you got to sacrifice if you want to be down with us. Jesus says no longer. I've gotten rid of that middle wall. Watch this. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. <laughs> Did you see that? Having abolished in his flesh the, what enmity? The enmity back there in Genesis 3.15. I'm getting rid of it now because I bruised the devil's head. And now I'm opening the way for everyone. So I'm getting rid of the law of commandments contained in ordinances. This is, um, it's the prescription of sin that he's getting rid of. So that he can make in himself of twain one new man and so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body of the cross having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you, which were what? Afar off the devil's seed, the devil's offspring, and to them that were nigh. In Christ's death, he has gotten rid of the enmity that he himself put there and said, now you want access to salvation? It's all open. Why? Because I just defeated the devil. I just defeated the devil. I just defeated the devil. I'm opening up the way to salvation to everyone. So it doesn't matter if you're in China. It doesn't matter if you're in Spain. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're in Africa. It doesn't matter if you're in America. It doesn't matter where you are. The blood of Christ is, is, is you can get it anywhere. Come on, guys, we're almost done, almost there. Notice Ephesians 2, for by grace, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What he's saying here 
in the very same chapter is this. Listen, you are not saved anymore by that circumcision of the Old Testament. You're no longer saved by going to the temple and going to Jerusalem. No, 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 no. You are saved by grace through faith. That means by the simple access of Christ, wherever you are, when you sin, when you realize I'm, I'm in sin, when you realize that the description of sin has condemned you, yes, you're guilty of sin. Yes, you're guilty of lying. Yes, you're guilty of murdering. Yes, you're guilty of worshiping graven images. Yes, you're guilty of putting other gods before you, before God. When you realize that, whoa, this, this is pointing to me. Now the cure is in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus forgives you of your sin. It does not wipe out what sin is. Let me say it again. The blood of Jesus does not nullify the commandment that says thou shalt not kill. That doesn't make any sense. Why would Jesus come and get rid of the description of the law? He came to offer a new prescription to forgive you of your sin, which sin is defined as the breaking of the commandments. God has not gotten rid of the law. Jesus has not gotten rid of the law. What he got rid of was the, was the process whereby one gains access to forgiveness. The ceremonial law has been done away with everyone. This is why Hebrews 2.14 says this. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise himself took part of the same, watch this, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In other words, I'm coming to deliver the devil's seed. I'm going to defeat the devil and then deliver those who were under his bondage. Deliver those who were of his seed. But it's only, they have to make the free will choice to do it. I'm not just going to deliver them. Okay, everybody's saved now. No, 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 no. They have to choose to be circumcised in the heart. And then this is why the Bible says, now, if you love me, keep my commandments. I delivered you. Keep my commandments. He's not talking about go sacrifice animals. He's talking about don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. He's talking about God shall have no other gods before me. The commandments of God have not changed my, my, my beloved Christian friend. So watch this. Genesis 3.15, number one, he would put enmity. That's the Old Testament. That's the ceremonial law. Number two, he would bruise the head of the serpent. He did that at the cross to provide a new cure. And number three, he now removes the enmity. He removed the ceremonial law, that, that, that which divided Jew from Gentile. And he says, now in me, in me, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, circumcision nor uncircumcision, in me, it is only Christ. Do y'all get it? Do y'all understand what was done away with and what still stands? Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year make the comers thereunto perfect. Watch this. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats, ceremonial law, that's my emphasis right there. I put that in there, ceremonial law. For it, shall, it is not possible that the blood of bull and goats, the ceremonial law should take away sins, the moral law. Wherefore he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering would, would thou, thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared for me in burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, ceremonial law, for moral law, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin thou wouldst not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that's the first cure, that he may establish the second. That's the second cure. 
Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is of witness to us, to, for after that he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, say the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Hmm. Hmm. How are y'all doing? I hope this is making sense to you. I got one, listen, Colossians 2. This is one of the other go-to verses. Listen and watch how it now and this makes so much sense. Watch what it says. Watch what it says. Colossians 2.10. And you are complete in him, which is the head and principality of power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See that? Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead, watch this, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, watch this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. You gotta be circumcised. You have to offer these sacrifices. You have to come to the temple. You have to come to Jerusalem. But I live a hundred miles away. Doesn't matter. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, circumcised at, at 20. Are you sure? Yes. And all, your, and all the boys in your house. And took that out of the way, nailing that to the cross. That's what he got rid of, guys. So Romans 2.25, for circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law, but if you be a breaker of the law, then circumcision is, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? I hope y'all are catching this. I hope this is making sense. John 14.15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Romans 13, 8, oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Beloved, the law still stands. Romans 39, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Beloved, Jesus said it himself in Matthew 22. The two great commandments are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And these are not two new commandments. They come from the Old Testament. Here's my final slide, guys. My final slide. In Daniel 2, you got to understand this. In Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar is given a dream. Zeonda, me too. Me too. All of this goes... If you understand Genesis 3.15, you have the foundation to understand what was the enmity that was put there and was removed. And it makes clear, crystal clear, what law still stands and what law was done away with. Listen, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he sees these nations rising, represented by this image of a man, and then a stone that is cut out of a mountain without hands destroys the image on its feet. Why is that significant? It's, it's significant for one simple reason. Not only does this stone represent Christ, I want you to understand that, but there is only one other place in the scripture where stone cut out of a mountain without hands occurred. And that is the law of God. That's the Ten Commandments. The world is on a moral decline. And it is because the world has turned its back on the Ten Commandments. But the world has turned its back on the Ten Commandments because they're simply following the example of the church who is preaching from pulpits every weekend that the law of God, that we're no longer under, grace, under the law, we're under grace, the law has been done away with. And the, and the confusing part about this is that they will turn around and speak to the heathen saying, you must keep the commandments of God. Thou shalt not kill. The law of God hasn't changed. These are not 10 suggestions. These are 10 commandments. You took the law out of public schools and public places. Beloved, listen to me. The law of God was never meant to be in public places. The law of God was meant to be written in the heart on these tables right here. My appeal to you, you're watching this. You've heard this for the first time. You didn't understand. Ah, oh, man, I should be keeping the law. And listen, I'm telling you, 
you will get slack. You will get, the Bible says the devil goes to make war with those who keep the commandments of God. If you decide today, I got to keep the commandments. I don't care what my preacher says. I don't care what it, the law of God still stands. And I understand it now. The devil's going to come at you. Best believe that. Understand that. But beloved, God has you. God's going to protect you. God is going to keep you. And so I'm appealing to you as, you as you listen to this, go back and search the scriptures for yourself and see if what I said is so. Search the scriptures. And beloved, when the spirit of God shows you truth, I, I implore you to follow it. I implore you to follow it. So please put a one in the chat if this made sense to you. Just, just put a one in the chat if this made sense to you. I'm going to, this, every end of the month, at the end of the month, I'm going to be preaching another message that is going to connect with what you heard today. It's going to be all doctrinal. So I'm doing this once a month. By the grace of God, if you're looking for truth, if you've been confused about certain things and you're looking for truth, I, I would encourage you to tune in because you're not going to want to miss these, okay? I want you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, Today, there are those who are struggling with what they've heard because they have heard truth and now they're wondering what to do with it. Lord, I pray that your spirit would guide them, would strengthen them, would encourage them, would give them holy boldness. Lord, would give them understanding, the understanding that you've given them today, Lord, give them the courage to walk out, to step out on that understanding and to do as you have said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Help them to understand that the law of God that was written uh, with your own finger is not done away with. That is the description of sin. What Jesus Christ came to abolish was the old cure and replace it with something that is universally available. Please, Lord, it's that simple. It's that simple. So, Lord, help us to grasp this truth, because if we can grasp this truth, then the other truths that are to follow will be easy to understand and everything will begin to make sense. And so, Lord, I'm praying for those who are watching this now and those who will watch this by faith in the future. Please let your spirit attend them as they listen and may conviction take over their hearts is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to thank you guys for tuning into this. If you're watching this for the first time, whether you're watching this live now or you're watching it in the future and you want to get more information, Pastor, I need more understanding on this law of God thing. I'm going to encourage you to email the church, okay? Specifically, you can email patrice at livingmana.live and she will get the email either to me or to Rick, our Bible worker, and we will follow up on it, okay? So God bless you. Uh, I want to encourage those of you that are on who want to stay on, uh, stay uh, after for the altar live. We'll put the altar live link up in the in the chat. Uh, there it is. If you want to get on for the after discussion, please feel free to join us there. And uh, you guys be blessed. Uh, and I will see you next week. God bless.